Thanks, everybody, for showing up to a talk that I always um, have some mixed feelings about because I feel like I'm biting the hand that feeds me. Um, I uh, teach at a small liberal arts college in South Carolina and have been um, in higher education for, I guess I taught my first college level course um, almost a quarter century ago. Um, and I've, I've taught, at a variety of, uh, I taught at a variety of places, including uh, Auburn as a grad student before I took my first full-time um, position. And uh, I've watched some changes in higher ed that are concerning. And I'm sure that you see this from most of you from the student perspective. And I think that higher ed is going through a crisis. Um, there are several aspects to this crisis. Um, I hope to address several of them here. Um, I'm going to talk about how college doesn't do what it advertises. Uh, that government subsidies are backfiring, uh, no surprise to most people in this room. And then also the uh, problem of politicized academic discourse, which I think is having a stifling effect on the kind of communication in conversation that we want to have in, in higher education. What the academy was originally intended to do is, um, is, is being uh, damaged by, by some of these things. So let's first look at the problem of college not doing what it's advertised to do. Some of you have figured this out already. If you've been in college for a little while, you realize that maybe you weren't learning what you thought you would learn or um, uh, you feel like maybe you're, you're paying more than college is worth, and, and uh, maybe some of you are having a kind of a crisis of your own. What am I doing here? Why am I still in, in these, taking these classes? Am I in the right place? Am I taking the right classes? Uh, um, is, is this really the right course uh, of action for me to, to spend four or more years in the college environment. So let's think a little bit about what college does. What is it supposed to do? What does it actually do? And so there's several ideas on this. One is um, the kind of straightforward, uh, this is what your parents say that college does for you, is just transfer human skills or human capital skills to you. You're, you're building up a repository of, of information and experience that you can then transfer into the uh, workplace and be a more productive person, uh, maybe be more fulfilled in your, in your uh, career track because of what you've learned, what you've stuffed into your brain over a course of study. Uh, another uh, a possibility is that higher education is, is, is a signal that it doesn't matter so much what you're studying, what matters is that you're demonstrating some characteristics about yourself that might be attractive to future employers. And uh, if, if you pursue some difficult course of study, then that's communicating to them that you're a hard worker, that you're intelligent or something. We'll talk about that in a, in a, in a, in a bit. Um, another possibility is that college is simply a consumption good, uh, that you go to college because you get to be around a lot of other people your age, and you have some fun, and you uh, colleges have started building all of these kind of recreational facilities, and your parents are sort of uh, duped into supporting you for an additional four years, and you, you're sort of on your own, you're away from your house, and your parents aren't right in your face all the time, but at the same time, you're, you're still uh, kind of on the parental uh, faucet. Um, so uh, that's, that's another possibility. This is a consumption good, and you're kind of pretending to do something productive while you're really having a lot of fun. And, and maybe it's a mixture of all three of these, these kinds of things, and, and that's certainly possible as well. Um, this is a preview of the first page of a book review that I have coming out in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics um, in the next few days. Uh, the first people to see this outside the editorial staff. Um, not like this is a great publication or anything. It's just a book review, but it's um, on Richard Vetter's new book. Well, it came out last year, I think, um, called Restoring the Promise, Higher Education in America. And a lot of what I am doing in this talk is, 
is drawing from some insights in his, in his book. Uh, this is not the first work that Vetter has written on higher education. He's um, a longtime observer of these kinds of problems. And um, I think his, his Restoring the Promise book is a great read for anybody who's really concerned about the trajectory of higher education in the United States. And probably in, uh, um, uh, insightful for some other countries as well, although his data and so forth are really focused on the US. So the traditional argument for college is that it makes you better prepared for the workplace by stuffing your head with various knowledge that you'll need to, 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 uh, to do what your employer will want you to do. And in fact, if you look at the historical uh, 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 incomes of people who have various levels of education, it's pretty clear that people who have um, a, a college degree in hand earn more than people who do not. And this is, this is the kind of thing that, that you're told by your high school guidance counselors, like you need to go to college because you'll earn more money. Uh, look at all the income that people are getting, uh, that people are earning when they, when they have this, this sheepskin in their hands and uh, see, you don't want to be one of those people that just quit after high school, um, and you don't want to drop out of college. You want to finish this and, and really do well for yourself. Now, one of the problems with this is that it is um, looking at the incomes of people who went through college maybe in the 1950s or 60s or 70s, and it's not really good at determining whether college is worthwhile for someone right now. Um, we have seen college costs go up. And if you're trying to make that decision about the, the, do the costs um, justify the, or do the benefits justify the cost, then you're, 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 this is not going to help very much. Um, because it's got all these people who went to college for like, and they paid a thousand dollars a semester or something, and now they're making whatever they're making at age, at age uh, sixty at their peak earning years, and that that's that's can be misleading. Um, this is uh, from Vetter's book. It's it's drawn from the from the census, but you can see um, the mean of workers over age twenty five. If you have a uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, the mean, and you're male, you're earning about $84,000 a year um, as of 2016. Uh, females with bachelor's degree earning about $54,000 a year. I'm not going to get into the gender gap discussion here. Um, that's um, an interesting discussion, but not, not one I'm tackling today. Um, and then, of course, you know, master's degree, doctor's degree, professional degree, it just seems to be more education equals higher incomes. Um, now, of course, people may go to um, college for different reasons, not just to earn more cash. There may be other things that you gain from a college education besides uh, higher future income. And you may feel like you are a, a, a better person because of, of, of what you know. And, and having that kind of uh, context for whatever it is that you choose to do in life might be enjoyable for you. Um, you, you feel like you're more well-rounded or literate or uh, you, you're able to understand the world around you better, even if it doesn't translate into uh, a higher salary. So I, I don't want to dismiss those considerations. Um, if you look at, uh, the, again, the, the kind of traditional argument for going to college and doing the four-year thing, uh, it does look like um, there are some... Uh, uh, advantages. The rate of return is, is uh, apparently not bad. Again, though, we're looking at historical numbers on what people have earned who maybe went to college when it was a lot cheaper. Um, so the, the internal rate of return for an associate's degree is around 20%, for a bachelor's degree around 15%. That's, that's pretty good. But again, looking forward, which is what most people in this room have to do, because of where you are in your in your uh, in your life, 
it's not necessarily going to be that high of a rate of return in the future. Sort of like looking at Social Security and saying, hey, well, you know, the first person who received Social Security um, benefits was this woman in Vermont named Ida Mae Fuller, and she collected more than $20,000 uh, over her life from Social Security, and she had paid in something like 22 bucks. Uh, well, that's a fantastic rate of return, right? But um, you <laughs> are not in that generation, and the math is not necessarily going to work out so well for, for you. Um, so if you look at the uh, education requirements of occupations held by college graduates, 52% um, um, are in jobs where they require a bachelor's degree. 37% um, uh, are in a, a job where only a high school education would be required. So they're over-educated, over-schooled, I should say, for the kind of job they're in, 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 in many cases. Um, so uh, you have around half of people who are matched well to the kind of job that required the education that they that they received in college. We have, and this is the, the, the kind of, um, you know, person that graduated from college and they ended up working in a, a coffee shop uh, doing something that is, you know, didn't require a four-year degree in, in, um, in, a, in sociology. Um, so, I'm picking on sociology. Uh, <laughs> uh, which, which I like to do. Um, so uh, if, if you, and this is from the uh, Federal Reserve, so um, I guess take that with a grain of salt, but um, the data indicate that, again, you've got people who are over-schooled for the kinds of jobs that they have, and this, this tends to support the idea that college might have been a consumption activity for these individuals. They went to school for four years, they majored in something that they liked, that they thought might be not require too much effort, uh, that was, um, they, their friends majored in this, and they've got something to talk about with their friends. Uh, and that they then graduated, and it's like, okay, now I, I, I have this degree, but um, the job market is not demanding people with the kind of education that I just obtained for myself, so what do I do? Well, I guess I'll go work for um, Starbucks. So um, we have a, a shift in, in this kind of thing over many decades. So if you look at this chart, again, from Vetter's book, uh, the black columns there, the black uh, bars that you see are from 1970, and it shows that um, uh, and this is the percentage of employees in these occupations that have a bachelor's degree or more. Um, in 1970, you had a tiny fraction of taxi drivers and chauffeurs that had a four-year bachelor's degree. Um, again, in shipping and receiving clerks, salesmen and sales clerks, firefighters, carpenters, bank tellers. Um, what, what do we see in 2010, 40 years later, we've got about 15% of taxi drivers that have a four-year degree. Uh, we've got about 25% uh, of salesmen and uh, re uh, sa sales clerks, people working retail, who have a four-year degree. You really need four years of education in anything like the kind of thing you get in formal uh, schooling to be able to be a success at that. Um, my grandfather had an eighth grade education. He went on to do quite well in, in, his, in his life doing a variety of things, uh, which included uh, being kind of a salesman for a while uh, for a candy company. And he, he did all right uh, with an eighth grade education. Um, are we wasting time sending people or encouraging people to go to school for four years to do something which in many cases is not um, it's not necessary to have that kind of, of, of schooling for. Now, uh, another possibility is that, as I said earlier, that students may be going to colleges and universities so that they can signal something to employers. So they go to college and they go through this four-year um, uh, 
project, basically, and they graduate, and what do they have to show for it? Well, they can show that, look, I persevered. I have some level of literacy and competency to be able to make it through these, these um, classes with a decent GPA, and, and I'm, I'm hardworking. Um, so uh, I, I'm motivated to some extent. I, I, I didn't drop out. I, I stuck to it, and I finished this project. Well, those are characteristics that a lot of employers find attractive. They want employees who will stick to the job, will finish the project, will show up on time um, day after day after day, like you're expected to do in classes, that know how to read, um, yeah, you know, those are those are desirable characteristics, and maybe college is simply a filter to kind of filter out those that don't have those characteristics. Um, so, uh, let's suppose you've got look at it this like sort of a, a pipeline here. Uh, you've got the population over here on the on the left, and the uh, red indicates people who are kind of unmotivated, not very persevering, maybe not very intelligent, and not, in other words, having the characteristics that employers tend to want. The blue indicates uh, people who are, and by the way, this is not supposed to be red and blue like Republican and Democrat, so don't take it that way. Um, anyway, uh, so um, the blue would be people who are motivated, persevering, intelligent, and, and so, uh, I've divided people, and of course we know people aren't, um, it's, it's not like that, but uh, for simplicity, some people in the population decide, hey, I'm going to go uh, try to get this signal. I'm going to get this, this sign that says, hey, I'm motivated, persevering, and intelligent. And so they go to college, which is the filter. And they either pass the filter and the college says, yeah, we put our stamp of approval on you and you, you got this diploma or degree that says you are motivated, intelligent, and persevering. Uh, or maybe you, maybe you, you fail or drop out um, and, and you're not certified as being motivated, persevering, and intelligent. And so you're in the same box here with people that didn't bother to go to the filter in the first place, some of whom are motivated, intelligent, and persevering. They just decided not to spend four years trying to get the, get the little stamp of approval that says that they're that way. Um, so you, you, end up, you end up in a box here that says, um, I'm, I'm either a person who bypassed the filter, bypassed the college and university process, or I, I didn't, I, I tried the filter and, 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 and it, it kicked me out. Um, it, it didn't let me through. Now, uh, this is not a foolproof um, filter, so you, you do get a few people that kind of pass through and they get their degree, and uh, maybe they maybe they are not very motivated, persevering, and intelligent. Somehow they they manage to to get through the filter anyway. All right, so this this is the filter. It's, it's not it's not that um, college is is not necess it's not necessarily the case that college can't be conveying some knowledge along the way, but scholars lately have, have argued that maybe this is, the, this is one of the key functions. I'll talk about one of, those, um, one of those arguments in a minute. But what happens to this process when the government comes along and says, hey, we think more people ought to go to college. We're going to subsidize college. We're going to make loans cheap or easy to get, and we're going we're to subsidize the colleges themselves. Um, we're going to encourage people financially to put themselves through this process. If that happens, here you get taxes extracted from the population that then are inserted into the higher education institutions uh, in, and encouraging people through these subsidies to put themselves through this higher education process, um, which means that... Um, you get colleges and universities that have an incentive to attract more students because the students come along with money bags that are handed to them by the taxpayers, well, by the government, money from the taxpayers via the government. So um, uh, the, the colleges and universities say, well, hey, this is great. We've got lots of, of 
of money. Uh, the more students we have, the more money we get. We can grow in size, and we 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 want to have more students going through our our process and. And in fact, this may lead to a problem I'll talk about a little bit later called grade inflation, where colleges and universities realize implicitly, they may not state this, but they realize that if we don't give students grades that are above a certain threshold, they might lose that subsidy, and then we lose the student, and we lose all the taxpayer dollars that came along riding on that student's back. And we don't want that to happen, so maybe there would be, maybe we should uh, go easy on the requirements and, and pass students. So we might end up with students that end up being certified. They've got their degree that says, hey, I'm certified, motivated, intelligent, and persevering, but they're not really. They just passed the system because the higher education institution had this incentive to, to, um, uh, uh, to keep them in classes for four years. Um, and then you get, you know, you still get people that bypass the filter, but maybe not so many. You get a lot of people that, that decide because this is subsidized, this is what I'm going to do with the next four years, five years, six years of my life. Um, Brian Kaplan wrote a book recently on this. He called it, uh, titled it The Case Against Education. Um, and he, he, he too is a, is a professor, and uh, you could say this is kind of a biting the hand that feeds him as well, um, but he says, "Look, we're 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 wasting we're wasting resources doing this, and the subsidies that are going to higher education are fostering this this kind of of um, uh, the, the, this this social waste. People are spending their time engaged in uh, uh, um, recreation or um, struggling through classes that really aren't going to help them in their ult what they're going to end up doing in their careers." So he says, once workers have been ranked, giving everyone extra years of education is socially wasteful. Furthermore, since the status quo is supported by hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies, we are probably underusing alternative certification methods like apprenticeships, testing, boot camps, and so on. You're here at Mises U. You're, you're learning something. You're here for the human capital. Um, I don't know a lot of employers that are going to say, oh, you went to Mises U. Um, and so, therefore, um, you're motivated, persevering, and intelligent. Um, that may be the case, but you're here to gather the, the human capital. What we see with mainstream higher education is, is quite possibly more of a signaling than it is actually uh, the, the knowledge that you're, that you're gaining. You're, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was a Mises U student one time. I came for the knowledge. I did not come because I thought that this was somehow going to boost my, um, my employment prospects. Um, although, again, it, it, it may. Um, so if, if mainstream higher education is being heavily subsidized, and therefore more people are entering this kind of signaling process, uh, this may explain why students tend to be more concerned about grades than actual learning. I mean, it's a constant frustration of, of faculty. It's like students say, well, I have a question about, um, uh, about something, and I say yes, and he says, uh, well, is, is such and such going to be on the test? And I, my, my heart just sinks a little bit when I hear that, because I think, well, don't you want to know this because you want to know this? I mean, is, is there more to this than just getting the number that I attach to your name at the end of the, end of the class? And, and I should know by now, this is, <laughs> why am I still being disappointed? Um, uh, I should be kind of hardened to that by now, but I'm, I'm, I still just die a little bit inside when students ask me, is this going to be on the test? I mean, rather than saying, you know, what is wrong with Keynesianism, which you know, I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, they're not as concerned about understanding except insofar as the understanding gets them a good grade. And, I, you know, I was a student once, too. I understand that to some extent. But um, what students want is an easy grade or easy A so that they can get that certificate that says I'm motivated, certified, um, intelligent, and so forth. But I'm, I, I don't necessarily 
know these things, but I look like someone who does. And that is, they, they got the signal. No, I'm certified. So um, this explains, Kaplan says, why students readily forget course material the day after the final exam, which, which does happen. Uh, so he says we, we need far less education, and the cleanest way to get far less education is to sharply cut government education spending. Employers will no longer expect you to have the education you can no longer afford. In other words, spending cuts will cause credential deflation. Those that have the credentials will have something much more valuable. Um, uh, you'll once again be able to get low and middle skill jobs with a high school degree or less, um, like my grandfather did. Um, he says there's little sign that education causes much enlightenment or civic understanding. Even at top schools, most students are intellectually and culturally apathetic, and most professors are uninspiring. Um, and, and that's true. A lot of professors have gotten so cynical about this process that's like, well, they just want the A. I don't want to spend a lot of time developing interesting lectures. I don't want to spend a lot of time grading. So it's just going to be an easy multiple choice test and uh, get you out the door, give you the A. You're not going to complain if I give you an A. If you get a B, maybe you're going to complain. So I'll just give you an A, and that way I don't have to deal with you. I mean, that's kind of the cynical view that, that faculty sometimes develop. And, and it's, a, it's a constant struggle when we're in this system to have to fight against that kind of temptation to be lazy and to be uninspiring because students often want the grade more than they want the inspiration. So um, a great piece on this is um, uh, Jonathan Newman's piece on Mises Wire from, from several years ago where he says students are running out of reasons to pursue higher education. Um, they're not really developing critical thinking skills. And in fact, we're, we're, we're uh, developing a kind of a university environment in which critical thinking is um, stifled. And, and we're seeing less of this over time. Um, Graduates, uh, he says, have little to no improvement in critical thinking skills at some of the most prestigious flagship universities. Test results indicate the average graduate shows little or no improvement in critical thinking over four years. Employers are beginning to discount the degree signal as well. Google, for example, doesn't care if potential hires have a college degree. They look past academic credentials for other characteristics that predict job performance. You know, Google, at least, is saying, we're interested in what you know. We don't care if you've got the little certificate that shows that you know it. We, we've got other means of kind of sussing out whether you've got those skills or not. I mentioned grade inflation a little while ago. And um, uh, in a Boston Globe article from several years ago, uh, Yale, one of the Ivy League prestige, top universities in the United States by reputation anyway, 62% of the grades are in the A range. Um, one national survey found that 41% have had grade point averages of A minus or higher compared to just 7% in 1969. And again, if you look at it from the, uh, like a faculty standpoint, there's this, I know, I, I, I just want to minimize the, um, the trouble and the harassment that students give me, right? That's the typical faculty member is going to say, I just, just take, take the A. What, so what is the cost to a faculty member in giving a student an A versus a B? I mean, the, the, my, my boss is not going to call me and say, why did you give the student an A, uh, an a instead of a B? So I, I'm not going to get that kind of complaint if I give students a lot of A's, even if they're not really justified or, or indicative of the knowledge that that student has on exiting my class. So the institutional environment is such that it incentivizes faculty to give more and more A's. And I would say there's been a shift in this. This is um, from 1940 to about 2012 or so. Um, 
The red line there is um, the percentage of A's. And you can see after the late 1960s, um, which around that time we saw a lot more people going to college and, getting, and bringing their government subsidies, student loan programs, and so forth that were encouraging people to go to college. And the percentage of A's has been rising. A lot of the money that rides in with students is tied to a GPA. If your GPA falls below a certain amount, then you lose your, your eligibility for the, the money. So faculty get pressured um, not just by the students, right? Not just by the students, but of course the students don't want to lose their eligibility for financial aid, so they're going to put pressure. And they, you know, I, I've had students come to me and say, "Look, if I don't get a C in your class, then I'm going to lose my financial aid, and I'll I'll, I'll have to leave." Well, what faculty member wants to be the per the, the person that's responsible for the student leaving the institution? And they just sort of tug on your heart on, on this. Um, and, and again, given that there's no limit on the number of A's I can give, the incentive is to just A's for everybody, right? Um, you notice how Mises U does this with the, um, with the testing at the end of the week, the optional testing that you have, the Mundlicha Prüfung, where um, we, not everybody will, will pass the written exam. Not everybody will pass the, will, will get the award at the end of the week. Um, there's, it's rationed. <laughs> and uh, uh, perhaps colleges and universities should think about doing something like this where they say, all right, each professor can assign A's to the top 10% of their class. And that's it. And if, if you do more than that, you're going to wind up in the provost's office. So, and you can assign as many Fs as you want, but you can only assign um, A's to 10% of your students. You know, that, that, that might, you know, but again, the, the institutions don't have an incentive to do this either because the money rides in on the back of the students and the students lose their GPA, then they, they drop out and the money goes away for the institution as well. So, uh, college, uh, is becoming less demanding for students over time. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> I know some of you study very, very hard, and it's hard to believe, and I, I'm, I'm sure most of you in this room are really hardworking students. Uh, you're, you're signaling, in fact, by being at Mises U that, that you are hardworking and interested in learning. Um, uh, that may not translate to any kind of points with your college or university, but you know, I, I see you here, and, and for what it's worth, I think more highly of you. Um, so what, what's happening over time is that students are spending less and less time studying, again from Richard Vedder's book. In 1961, students were spending about 40 hours a week, if they were full-time college students in the United States, they were spending about 40 hours a week on academic work. In 2003, that had dropped to under 30 hours a week on academic work. Um, I don't have data, and, I, and Vetter didn't provide the data on what's happened since 2003. Uh, the last 18 years, I, I don't know what, what that looks like. But the trend is definitely uh, less demanding work. Second crisis, government subsidies are backfiring. This is the student loan debt clock as of yesterday. I was on that web page, and I was watching this number just tick up by the second as students are are uh, borrowing more and more money, uh, $1.8 trillion as of yesterday. Um, last year when I gave this talk, it was somewhere around $1.7 trillion, um, and it just keeps, keeps going up. So tuition is going up. Students are borrowing more to pay the tuition, and there is uh, some evidence that the... Um, that the colleges and universities are raising their tuition as students become more and more eligible for student loan debt. So it's not like students' out-of-pocket expenditures are really declining. It's that they, 
government says we're going to subsidize higher education. And rather than pass those subsidies on to students in the form of lower, lower tuition, colleges and universities have simply said, well, uh, great, you have more money to spend. Uh, we're going to raise our tuition. Uh, so you can see um, the blue line there is the consumer price index. Um, it, we know that there are problems with the consumer price index as a measure, but we'll, we'll turn grandma's picture to the wall and just look at it for, for now. Uh, the red line there is the, is the tuition cost at a public four-year institution. And notice what's happened in the last 20 years. I mean, that's just accelerated. Um, if you look at the ratio of average tuition and required fees for all four-year degree-granting institutions relative to median household income, that too has been rising. So you could say, well, college has gotten more expensive, but households are earning more money, so it's, it's not any less affordable. Well, no, it, it is actually less affordable than it, it was for households. And of course, households are borrowing much more to pay for um, a higher education than they, than they once were. And we're seeing that um, student loans have become a real burden on recent graduates. The uh, red line that you see here that was about the third largest um, source of delinquencies on, on loans uh, is, is now um, higher than all the rest. Uh, the percentage of the balances, at, this is as of 2017, but um, the percentage of balances 90 plus days delinquent is, it has increased sharply for student loans. So students are borrowing more money but they're not necessarily able to pay it back. Part of the problem is students that borrow money, they go to college, they borrow more money, but they don't finish. And uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the arguments for this kind of signaling hypothesis for higher education is that a student that goes seven semesters to college and drops out right before finishing has a much lower income potential than a student that finishes the program out and has that sheepskin. Um, in fact, it's called the sheepskin effect. Almost finishing college is not nearly as good as finishing because it, it doesn't carry the same signal. Even though, theoretically, you've got seven-eighths of the knowledge that you would have had if you'd stayed the final semester. In fact, Arguably, you've got more than seven-eighths of the knowledge, and yet you don't get seven-eighths of the income boost that a person who has the degree would have. Um, and so you see these people that go to college, and for whatever reason, personal circumstances or money runs out or whatever happens, and they drop out, and they're stuck with seven-eighths of the debt, but only a tiny fraction of the in income boost. And they run into real financial trouble. A market has natural mechanisms for uh, punishing credit abusers, mechanisms that decrease the likelihood that these individuals will be the beneficiaries of credit in, the future, in, in future transactions. Unfortunately, such mechanisms are not intrinsic in federal financial aid, where everyone enjoys equal status regardless of their ability to satisfy debt-related obligations. This is from A.G. Smith's um, article on Mises.org, The Bubble in For-Profit Schooling. And um, I, I, I cut out a lot of the stuff I was going to say about for-profit schooling, but um, there are a lot of people, mainly um, a few years ago when we saw this kind of attack on for-profit schooling, and they, they began to associate the profit motive with the problem that we were seeing in a lot of uh, for-profit institutions. It's not the profit motive that's the problem here. Uh, but for-profit institutions of higher education were tending to provide education to uh, groups that were uh, very different from what your typical 18 to 22-year-old full-time college student uh, was. So um, they, were, they were providing education to people that might be 
you know, working adults, um, and they've got a lot of, they've got busy lives, a lot of stuff going on, life happens to people, they might have to um, compromise a little bit on their academic time because they've got kids and jobs and all kinds of stuff going on. And so um, the for-profit higher education got, I think, an undeserved um, uh, bad reputation uh, because it was serving a group that had difficulties that the, the mainstream colleges and universities didn't have to deal with. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's my short take on, on that. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the studies here that I had referenced. So where does this money go? I mean, colleges are raising their tuition. They're getting all this money riding in on the back of students. And what, what's happening? I mean, what I've observed is that it's not really going to academics. It's not really going to, you know, expanding uh, either the number of faculty or the competency of the faculty or uh, other academic kind of, of inputs. Uh, it's going to things that make students more comfortable um, and, and contributes to their recreation and their enjoyment of, of their 40 years. So uh, dormitory improvements, um, you can see this in Auburn. I mean, I, I, I went to graduate school here, and I, every time I come back, I'm just shocked at the, the growth of what appear to be, I haven't been inside, but appear to be really luxury accommodations for students. And, uh, you know, I remember the student housing that I was in when I was here, and it was um, not luxury. And... Uh, <laughs> So Princeton, for example, spent $136 million on a student dorm that had leaded glass windows, a cavernous oak dining hall. Uh, it was $300,000 per bed. I mean, this is incredible. And uh, taxpayers largely are funding this. Um, since 2000, New York University has provided $90 million in loans, many of them zero interest and forgivable to administrators and faculty to buy houses and summer homes on Fire Island and the Hamptons. Former Ohio State President Gordon Gee earned nearly $2 million in compensation, this would have been 2012, while living in a 9,600 square foot Tudor mansion on a 1.3 acre estate. $673,000 in art decor, a $532 shower curtain in a guest bathroom, uh, $23,000 a month for uh, basically parties and travel on a private jet. Um, administrator bloat is well known now in colleges and universities. So we see, um, if you look at the number of employees at colleges and universities, it's not that the number of faculty has increased that much. I mean, it has maybe somewhat with the increase in enrollment, but where you really see the, the highest percentage growth is in various um, administroids and deanlets and uh, the, the, the kind of middle management of, of higher education. Um, uh, I, I, I love the place where I teach. I don't want to say anything negative about the place where I teach, but... Uh, when, I, when I arrived at that institution um, about 20 years ago, there was, um, there was a dean of students, and there was an academic dean, and there was maybe one other dean. I can't remember. That was it. Um, and we're just like every other place that I know of, where we've just expanded the number of deans and associate deans and assistant deans and various other people that work in their offices. University of California system has 2,400 approximately administrative staff just in the president's office. This is massive, right? Vetter says 30% of the adult population has college degrees. The, col the Department of Labor tells us that only 20% or so of jobs require college degrees. We have 116,000 janitors in the United States with bachelor's degrees or more. Why are we encouraging more kids to go to college with this, with this money? Um, ultimately, if you want college to be more affordable, disinvest taxpayer dollars in higher education and try to, to, to 
uh, remove all of these all of these subsidies. I did not get to the last crisis, which is probably for the best, <laughs> uh, on politicized academic discourse. We had a, a talk earlier this week on kind of cancel culture, so we. Uh, you, you know some of this already from personal experience, perhaps. But I'll stop there, and thank you very much for...